All right. Uh, oh, Cadence is already gone, huh? Oh, she is. All right. If we, God was just speaking to a couple people, so Cadence and Katrina are going to come up really quick and share something on their hearts. Come on up, Cadence. Give them a hand. So, so during the last song, I started to just think about what the words meant, and it went a lot deeper than I thought it would. It just, the words just mean so much. And God has opened a way for you to enter heaven. And he is the champion of heaven. And when you think about the greats, the greats part when it's like waves, it's not really waves. It's just, it just is yeah, that's an example of grace. And it just really spoke to me. And I feel like a few people, they're just like, oh, it's just a song. It's just, it's just a song about God. No, it's much. It's a lot more than that. <laughs> that's true. Awesome. Yes. So what just came upon Cadence is the spirit of understanding. And what I was sensing through worship was that the spirit of understanding begets praise. And when we struggle to praise or we struggle to worship or it feels like we're disconnected from the words of a song, it's because we need to get understanding. Proverbs says get understanding, get wisdom. If you think that God is this mysterious God who doesn't want to disclose himself to us, then it's going to be hard to worship this unknown being. But that's not who he is. Check out this verse. We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages of our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the hearts of man the things which God has prepared for those who loved him. So that sounds pretty mysterious. But God <laughs> has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him. Even so, no one knows the things of God, uh-oh, except the spirit of God. Now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who's from God. And if you just cherry pick half of each of those scriptures, you're going to come out with the core belief and doctrine that you can't possibly understand. But it actually is saying the opposite. It's saying that's what they believed. But now we have received the spirit of God and the spirit of God is multifaceted and it says in Isaiah and one of his facets is understanding. And when we get understanding, we're able to enter into worship in the way that Cadence just did so beautifully and it becomes this overwhelming experience. You might think we look crazy up here, but it's just because we understand what we're saying. Yeah. <laughs> and when you understand what you're saying, you get a little crazy. <laughs> awesome. Thank you guys. Thank you, Cadence. That's so powerful. Because really, Cadence, you need to know too, that when you can perceive and understand on the level that Katrina is saying when you're your age, what heights are you going to climb? What things are you going to do in the kingdom of God? Okay, so we speak blessing over you, that you are going to be a leader of many people in your lifetime, that you are going to be a praiser, and that you're going to lead many people into the courts of praise and into understanding in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Awesome. I, I love what they both said, and I love that the way that this day has started, because the thing that has been impressed on my heart as I've been preparing for this message is that we all want to win, right? Like, we want to win at life. Does anyone not want to win at life or, like, do well? Like, we all want to do well, right? I want to do well. I deeply and intrinsically want to do well in life. And I always have since I was a kid. I never wanted, I, and you know, like we all have different personalities and have thought about these things to different extents, and I probably more than others. But um, I never wanted to make mistakes. I hated the thought of making a mistake. Like that was just like who I was. Like that's the, that was my makeup. I was like, oh, how can I, can I avoid every mistake? Because I hate mistakes. I hate regret. I hate thinking that I could have done better. 
Um, and I wanted life to be a formula so that I could, like, math. Like, I love math. Because isn't math so great? There's always a right answer. It's like the best thing ever. I love it. I, I, I couldn't get enough of math when I was in school. <laughs> also, my kids are, have learned um, um, informal logic, and it's a lot like math. And I also just deeply love to learn logic. It's like so satisfying. It's like every equation equals a, an, an answer that is equitable to one another. I love that. I'm like, yes, give me the solution manual. Give me the equations. Give me how to do things. And I feel like on some level, we really all want to do well. Maybe not everyone is obsessed with not making mistakes as I was. And I've learned how to get over that and be okay with making mistakes and having grace because there will be mistakes made and there will be things that go wrong and there isn't a black and white formula for every single thing in life. So that, that, that also exists. But I also think that largely as Christians, we should want to do well. And I think we have to start there at that foundational core value. I am a child of God. Therefore, if I don't take it on as my responsibility to do well, for myself, and not just for myself, though, but for others, that I am missing something in the makeup and design of who God has called me to be. Because God does all things well. Is there a thing he doesn't do well? He does all things well. And if I am made and created in his likeness and image, and if I bear his DNA because I've received the incorruptible seed of heaven into my heart, and if I am born again into a new nature in Christ, then I also reflect the goodness of my Father. I also reflect the goodness of all that he is capable of, and I want to tap into that. And I want us to tap into that, and I want us to tap into that not just so that we can have great lives. I want us to have great lives but so that the world can be affected by the goodness of God. Because I think that to some extent we're living in a, in a society right now. I'm going to say the opposite of what you think. I think we're living in a society right now that has actually been affected by Christ in, in the biggest way in human history. And it's beautiful. And I think the goodness that we live in, all the good things that we can point to, are actually born out of that reality. Okay, you can look back on history, you can look around today, and you could easily point out every problem, every flaw, every shortcoming, everything that you don't like. But if you have um, a bigger vision of history of the world, you can actually look and see, wow, look at how far we've come. Look at the things we've overcome as humanity. Look what, what, look what humanity has done equipped with the word of God equipped with faith. Humanity has taken great leaps and great strides because of the faith of the few. It has blossomed into this beautiful country that we live in that is the greatest, what do they call it, the great experiment. It's one of the greatest experiments to ever befall the world. No country, I don't know if you know this, but no country had ever existed before that, that had the components of what we're living in right now. Before we came to be, individuals didn't matter. You don't even know that. Well, maybe you do. <laughs> Some of you do. Some people don't know that. Some people don't know that there was the, the pervasive mindset in the world devalued the individual for, for the greater good, for the needs of a king and a kingdom, uh, for the needs of one family who sat on a throne somewhere and people paid homage to them and their lives were, you know, of lesser and lesser value as they went down the class system. The, these things were what people lived in. They were born into poverty. They were born into depravity, never to be valued as an individual, never to be told that you are loved, except that Christianity broke through these mindsets and God came and Jesus said, oh, wait, no, 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 no. I came for you. I died for you. You, the individual, not just you, the corporate community, or you, the laborer, or you, the, the group, uh, or the nation, or the kingdom, but you, the individual. And these are the things that we're established on in this country. And so we live in it, and we take it for granted. 
And we think, of course people matter. Of course the individual matters. Like, it's so deep inside of us, we don't question it. But what you need to know is that it didn't exist until Christianity birthed it into this world. Okay, so we're living in the greatest time to ever be alive because you as an individual matters. And most, mostly, most everyone in this country will give you that respect. More than ever before in history. So even the worst of what you experience today is better than the best of what they experienced then. Sometimes we have to tell ourselves that. Okay, so the thing that I wanted to title my message today, but I had so many different titles, was How to Win at Life. That was my first one. I was like, yes, how to win at life. But then I was like, well, what about how to produce good fruit? That's a good one, too. I want to produce good fruit. And then I was like, how about how to be unshakable? Yes, I want to be unshakable. What about unstoppable? I want to be unstoppable. <laughs> and I kept writing down more and more and more. So you can take all of those. Oh, and then the last one, the addendum was, and other lessons I'm teaching my kids. Because I thought all of the things that were rolling around in my soul, are you guys writing it down up there? Who's in charge of this? <laughs> um, all the things that are rolling around in my soul are things and conversations that I have with my kids on a regular basis. You can follow up and check with Jackson after to double check me on this. But I realized that as a parent and as a mom of many years, I have um, looked at my children. And, you know, let me start here. We all bear fruit, right? We all bear fruit in some way. And what that means is, like, our lives produce things. The fruit of our life is what we produce. And I don't know if you know this, but your fruit takes on your flavor. You know, the word of God, it's talking about false prophets and it's warning people, you know, don't fall prey to false prophets. But it says in the end of that scripture, it says, but you'll know them by their fruit. And it was this little scripture in the Bible that was talking about something specific, but it unlocked an entire um, point of view for us to remember and to live by that if we need to know something about someone, all we need to do is take a look at their fruit. If we want to know what their flavor is, take a look at their fruit. And we'll know something about them that we might not be able to know in any other way. And so as I look at my life, I'm like, okay, like because I want to evaluate my fruit. So I'm not trying to evaluate your fruit. I'm not trying to judge you. I'm not trying to get to the nitty-gritty of, you know, what you did right or wrong in your life. That's actually not what this tool is about. It's actually about self-evaluation. Let me take a look at my fruit. What am I producing in my life? And we all should take a good look in our, at our fruit and, and ask ourselves, what are we producing with our life? So to me, like, the number one is my kids. Like, that's, that's my number one, excuse me, <clears throat> fruit. And when I look at them, <laughs> it's like good, bad, and ugly, man. I see a mirror reflection of myself. <laughs> and I can, I can look at that and, you know, like we have a tendency to get frustrated at our kids for our own weaknesses. <laughs> More than anything else, I think that our weakness in them frustrates us the most. Like, we're like, why do you do that? Why, why are you acting that way? And we're like, it's, it's really this indictment against ourselves that we, you know, we feel it's so heavy and we're like, oh, God, help me to overcome it because really they're just little mirrors and images of us, just like we are of our Father in heaven, right? And so I look at my kids and I'm like, okay, that's my fruit. And I want that fruit to be good fruit. I want to leave a deposit in the world of goodness. I want to leave it better than where I found it. I want to do well in life. I want to win at life. I want to be unstoppable. I want to be unshakable. And it starts with evaluating my fruit and saying, what am I producing in my life? So I have a lot of conversations with my kids. Just like Mark said, I do let them know my expectations. <laughs> I'm laughing because I'm a little bit of an over-talker. I know you're shocked to find that out, but um, sometimes Jackson's like, does it always have to be a lecture? <laughs> He's like, you could have just said no. <laughs> and I'm like, yes, it does. In fact, it does always have to be a lecture because I got a lot of words to get out right now. Got to let them out on someone. Your dad's sick of it, so I got to let it out on you now. <laughs> But 
but we have a lot of conversations. But the other side to that is also because I want to. I want to reveal to them the bigness of the things that God's revealed to me. I don't want them to have to walk through the trudge, the drudge, and the, the trauma of what I've walked through. I want to be an open book to say, hey, here's what I've learned in my 40-something years of life so far on this planet. Here's the places where I got tripped up. Here's the places where I won. Here's the places where I've seen other people get sidetracked. Here's the places where I see people do well. You know, I'm always constantly informing them of the secrets to success in life. And it's not always just evidence-based. Evidence is good but it's always word-based. So we want to evaluate the fruit of our lives. When I look at the fruit of my lives, I look and, you know, also the fruit of your life is, it's never going to be only influenced by you. There's, you know, Mark is a part of their makeup and, and he's equal parts um, influential in who they are too. So, so this is something important to remember. We're co-laborers together. And as we look at the fruit of our lives, you know, we're not just seeing our own contribution, but we're seeing each other in it as well. Because I can look at the worship team too and say, that's my fruit too. I've labored over that. I've, I've given my life to, to see that thrive. But it's not just me. Many people have labored over it. Many, people, um, may, many people's handprints are on it. But I look at those things. I look at some of those things. So if you want to see the fruit or if you want to see something about you, if you want to be able to start identifying the things in you that are um, successful and victorious and the things that maybe aren't, take a look at your fruit and start to ask yourself, why am I not seeing the fruit that I want to see? Now, like I said, sometimes we partner with people. And so sometimes there's only so much we can do. Um, maybe you are divorced and you are co-parenting and you don't have control over that other side of the influence. And that's okay. So I think it's like important to evaluate all of these different scenarios. Not every scenario is going to be so directly linked to you, but you have to evaluate your part. What's my part in this? What is my part? How can I take an imperfect situation and invest and sow in the very best of what God has to offer so that I can see the fruits of goodness in my children's lives? Yeah. So that I can see the fruits. I mean, maybe it's at your job. Your work is the fruit of your life. And that's not only under your influence, but what part can you play to shape and make it the very best that God has called it to be? Because the word says, do everything as unto the Lord, right? Yeah. Yeah. So in our jobs, in our ministries, with our children, we want to do the best. And we want them to win. But we also want to take a look at our fruit and say, okay, how can I improve on these areas? Um, okay, so in order to produce good fruit, I think we all have to start from on agreeing on a few points that are really important. So point number one is that, God wants you to live a successful life. People believe that to varying degrees. Some people don't believe that. Some people believe God made me sick for his glory. Okay, so that's something that some people believe. I do not believe that. Um, I believe God wants you to live in success. Some people believe that there is a prosperity gospel out there and it is evil. And I'll cautiously approach this because I will say that there are ideals that can surround prosperity that can be way off base um, because we're not in this for just ourselves. We're not in it so that we can be um, flashy and famous and get all the fancy things we want. And yet, God wants you to have money. He wants you to have resource. He wants you to increase. He wants you to expand your tent pegs, if you will. He wants you to live in success. If we don't believe that in the core of who we are, it will affect our fruit. We will not ever produce the right kind of fruit for the kingdom if we buy into the idea that God doesn't want me successful. God doesn't want me to be wealthy. God doesn't care if I'm well. In fact, he wants me to use all of my trials for his glory as if somehow our trial gives him praise. Our trial doesn't do anything for God. 
His victory manifested through trial is what brings the glory of God about in the world. Okay, so we got to get our minds straight on that fact. The trial is the problem. The problem exists because sin. The, tr the solution and the victory and the glory of God is in him, in us moving and changing. It's in faith. It's in the declaration of victory. It's in the belief that he wants me to have success over the trial. If I don't believe he wants me to have success over a trial, why, why am I going to bother to even? If I think he wants me to be sick for his glory, I'm not going to be praying for him to heal me. That doesn't make sense. But if I believe that he wants me to be well in spite of my sickness, <laughs> then I get on board with him in faith and I say, yes, God, be it unto me according to your word. And I start to activate my faith and I start to say, no, not today, Satan. This is my body. My body is a temple of the living God and you have no access here. And I'm going to live and I'm not going to die. Okay, and I'm not trying to also sell you a false a false narrative that everything always works out and everything is always perfect. And tomorrow, after you say your declaration of faith, you walk, you know, right out of your trial. That's not how it works either. What, so I said this on Wednesday. Faith is a lifestyle. Faith is not luck. Faith is not uh, the genie of the lamp. Faith is not, you know, the, the jackpot of heaven. It doesn't produce things in a carnal way. Faith produces things through the longevity of you being connected to heaven and standing firm against all other things, against even what your eyes tell you to believe. Faith anchors you to truth and says, no, my God will. <laughs> and, and Paul even said, whether I live or I die, I am the Lord's, right? So there is, faith has this, this radical edge to it that's like, it all, you know, I'm believing for the best. But even if it looks like I didn't get my victory, actually, I did. <laughs> because actually, to be gone from this body is to be present with the Lord, and there's nothing better than that. That's how he put it. So keep, keep that in mind. But God wants you to live a successful life. It says in Psalm 1, 1 through 3, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in season, whose leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does will prosper. Whatever he does will prosper. That's a promise to you. That's a promise to you that you have access through. It requires something of you, but it's a promise to you that you have access to. It says in 3 John 1, 2, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. I pray that you may prosper in all things. And be in health just as your soul prospers. God wants you healthy. He wants you whole. He doesn't want you living under anxiety and torment. That's right. He doesn't want you uh, depressed and anxious. Right. Right. He doesn't want you tormented by mental instability or troubles in your emotions. And some of you have given up the fight and thought, well, this is just my disposition for my life. This is just what I have to deal with. I just have to be dependent on medication or the system or whatever it is. And, and I'm not against those things at all. But what I am saying is that, no, that's not true. There is victory for you over everything that ails your body, over everything that plagues your mind, over everything that's coming against you. There is victory, but it is going to take a lifestyle of faith to overcome it. Okay, it's not just a prayer meeting. It's not just, it's not just come to the front, let me lay hands on you. I'm healed. So I'm not saying that can't happen, and it does. That's because someone else was living a lifestyle of faith. That's because you were living a lifestyle of faith. It's a lifestyle of faith that produces the environment to create the miracle that can come in and rescue you from the torment of this world. Yeah, right. Okay? Amen. You believe that? All right, and then finally, Psalm 37, 4 says, delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. So not only does he want you to live in success, he wants to grant you the desires of your heart. That's beautiful. That's really beautiful. That's not the God we've heard of in other times and other places. He wants to grant you the desires of your heart. 
take rest in that. Take, I mean, okay. This is such a stupid example, but I always use it. But it's just me, so I can only use my own examples, right? I am me. I love shopping. I know, you know. <laughs> I get stars in my eyes over fashion and clothes and shopping and all this stuff. And I've come up against these feelings sometimes where I'm like, this is too much. This is, I'm overdressed. This morning, I was one of them. I was like, am I overdressed for this random Sunday in January where it's snowing out? <laughs> And I'm like, no, I'm not, because where else am I going to wear this? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> this is the only moment I have to pull out the big guns. Okay. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but I have fallen under a little bit of, like, guilt and condemnation at times to be like, that's, you know, it's vanity, it's wasteful, it's, you know, you come against these ideas and these ideals that are living in the world, but you know what is so liberating is that we are in a body of believers who lifts the lie, they lift the bondage. My mom laughs in the face of the lies and the, the bondage that wants to come on you from ideals of man that don't come from the word of God, and so I've been able to break out of that because because the truth is that God wants to grant me the desires of my heart. <laughs> Just like he wants to grant yours and yours are going to be different than mine. But he wants you to walk in the fullness of who he's created you to be. And you don't even know what some kind of stupid little shopping obsession, <laughs> what he's going to use it for or how he's going to turn that for your good. Or for someone else's good. You don't know. You don't know. You don't know why you have these desires. But he does. Submit them to him and have joy as you walk them out. Stop. Get rid of the guilt. Get rid of the guilt. Come on. He's laid out the things that he doesn't want you to partake in. They're pretty clear. And it's kind of a short list. It's not that bad. It's like, hey, don't do the worst things of the worst things in the world. That's it. And it's like everything else is okay. It's like not that bad. <laughs> Just don't murder people. Man. Don't, you know, don't commit adultery, uh, don't get drunk, um, you know, you go on the list. It's really not that horrible of a list. It's like, hey, I think I can do this. I think I got this because all this other stuff is allowable. Not only allowable, but he's called us to have joy and fun and laughter and enjoyment in this life. And we shouldn't forsake that for some religious idea that we need to be holier than thou. It's not true. All right. Point number two, hopefully I can make it through all these points. He wants you to take part in a community of faith, and he wants you to have fellowship. Okay, we have to agree on this foundational issue. He created you for fellowship. He created you for family. But more than that, he also called the church into being for the purpose of of spreading the gospel, of anchoring us in truth, and of creating a synergy in this world that could affect things for him. <clears throat> the church isn't our idea. If you think it's our idea, then you're not going to buy into it. But you have to understand, this, doesn't this is not our idea. It doesn't belong to us. This is Jesus' body. This is his church. This is, this is his bride. And he's in charge. We're not, we're not in charge. We have authority in the places he's put us in authority. But he is the, he is the, um, we are his bride. He's the head. Right? Right. Do we believe that? And do we believe on an individual level that, yes, I am called to be a part of that? It says, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promises is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some. I want you to hear the important things that he mixed that in with. It's all one thought. Having our hearts 
sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. This is life and death stuff, what we're talking about right there, okay? We don't go to heaven without it. We don't get salvation without this, what he's saying. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. This is faith, for he who promises faithful. And, and in the same statement with our pureness and our salvation and our very life breath, he says, let us consider one another. It's that important. Don't downplay it. Don't. Don't take it for granted. Don't let your experiential pain become your foundation for forsaking the thing that God has called into being. And and I'm sorry if you've been hurt. I am sorry. I have been hurt too. We all have. We've all taken bullets. We've all taken bullets for Jesus and for one another and for the sake of the gospel. We've all been in church and we've all gotten it somehow, some way, one way or another, right? Right? Because it's vulnerable to love. It's vulnerable to love. It's, it's a space that we put ourselves in of service and of sacrifice toward people who we, we do not um, demand a return on that love. We don't, we don't put a demand on the love that we have here. It's the agape. Pastor Tony talked about it last week. If you didn't listen to it, you should go back and listen to his message. It's so good. Agape is a one-way love. That almost sounds like counterintuitive. <laughs> Agape is a one-way love. It's a love that is born out of me and expects nothing in return. And it doesn't mean that I'm just a doormat. That's, that's not what it means. But it does mean that my love goes one way and it's extended to you at all times, whether or not you choose to partake in it and reciprocate it. Okay, so... That's where it can be vulnerable. That's where our flesh, our humanity can become hurt. It can become confused. Things can go wrong. And yet, by the grace of God and by his spirit, we are able to even take those hard situations and turn them around and find victory in the middle of them and recreate. God recreates us into stronger versions of ourselves through the very thing that was meant to destroy us if we can persevere in faith. If we can honor him above all else, if we can say, this is your idea, God, the church is your idea, the gathering is your idea, and I'm not going to forsake it. I'm going to be a part of it. I'm going to give myself over to this thing, even as imperfect as I might think it is. I believe that you know the truth. I believe that what you say is better than what I think. What he says, it's better than what I think. All right. Number three, we have to agree on this one. You are the move of God. Um, the move of God, a move of God. God move. God, you know, we, oh, so many things about move, a move of God. God, without us in this space, in an empty space, isn't here. And he's not moving there in an empty room because he doesn't move on things. He moves within the hearts of his people. The move of God happens, it begins, and it ends inside of you unless you make a move. The move of God happens in your conscience, your, your consciousness. It happens in the space where you understand what he's called you into. See, the thing is, is that when Jesus died on the cross and he said, Jesus said, it is finished. That set into motion the greatest thing, the greatest move of God that had ever happened, you know, upon the face of the earth. And, and as that happened, it says before the foundations of the world. God, you, we see God there entering his rest. I think that's important that we understand that God is at rest in this one sense. He's like, I did it. I'm at rest. God has entered his rest. Do you know that? Does that mean something to you? He's done the full and complete work. Um, sometimes we say, he works all things together for my good. The Bible doesn't actually say that. It actually says 
All things work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. We have imagery in our mind about God working, doing, moving, fighting. And, and there's a sense that we understand like he is our source and he is our sustenance. So he is moving inside of us. He is alive inside of us. He's not, he's not dead. He's not dull. He's not stagnant. But the point of it is that he has transferred the responsibility of authority in this world to you. Until we can agree on that and understand it, we will continually be asking for a move of God without understanding that we are the completed and fulfilled move of God on the earth. And we must move for there to be a move. Until you reach out and touch the brokenhearted and the lonely, they will not be loved. Until you come into the courts of praise and bring your faith together with the saints and start to stir up something in the spirit, no one's getting healed. Until you make space in your consciousness for God to speak to you, you will never hear his voice. You are the move of God. It says in Luke 10, 17 through 20, because Jesus had sent um, 70 out to go spread the good news. And it said, then the 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over the power of all the, uh, all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. That's powerful. Jesus transferred authority to those disciples to say, I'm giving you this power to trample on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. This is a big key in our lives, people. We've got to get a hold of this. We have to see ourselves right in the, in the, um, in the space of heaven, in the space of earth. We have to understand what our job is, what we've been called to, what God's asking of us. He is our equipper. He is our source. He is our life. He is our sustenance. And yet he's asking us to make the move. And we have to take that on and we have to understand that. It's so important. All right, so those are the things we have to agree on. And these are three different points. And these are the how-to points. So if we can agree on those three points... We're going to get somewhere. We're going to get there. We're going to get somewhere good. Like, really, if we all come into the corporate body understanding those things, things start changing. If we really believe them, if we really take them on board and say, this is my job, my responsibility to foster this thing that God has given me, to become the ambassador of heaven that he's called me to be, to stand my ground, to believe that he wants me to prosper, to take my authority in the spirit, We're going to see change. We're going to see the change that our hearts so long to see. Because don't you want to see change in situations in the world, in your life? Don't you want to see people come to people who are tormented? We're seeing a lot of tormented souls out there right now, I think. I think we're seeing more tormented people than ever. And I think, you know, it's just, it's actually a symptom of the ease of life in in a way. It's like when life becomes really easy, um, the enemy still attacks your mind, but you don't have to work hard to survive, so you get and easily get caught up in that, whereas, you know, people who are, um, have to, you know, hunt down a chicken so that they can not starve to death have other worries on their mind besides, you know, anxiety and getting tormented by demonic thoughts. It can happen to them too, but I think that this large scale that we're seeing the torment on people's minds is coming from a place of ease. It's so easy to just be. It's easy to exist right now. It's easy to be entertained. It's easy to eat. It's easy to live. I mean, the government will, like New York State will literally give you, uh, they'll, they'll care for you. Yeah. You know, if you don't have a job, if you don't have health insurance, like it, it's, it's actually like, it's so beautiful for the people that need it. But I think for some people, it becomes a, a hindrance for them to achieve the purpose in their life. So we also have to, we have to fight for people. We have to fight for those people to say, hey, no, you're not just, you're not just um, the responsibility of the government to, so that you can get by in life. No, like God has a purpose and a calling for you. And in that purpose and calling and in that space where he wants to reveal himself to you is the space of freedom for your mind. That's where you're going to find freedom from torment. 
Okay, so the three keys to walking this out. Number one is that we walk by faith and not by sight. Okay, the only way that we can be successful in this life via the avenue of the kingdom of God is that we have to walk by faith and not by sight. Okay, so a couple of things to think about. The scripture doesn't say walk by faith and not by doubt. That's not what it says. It says walk by faith and not by sight. So we need to understand what is faith and what is its nemesis. Because we would think doubt is the nemesis of faith, right? Or, or the antithesis of faith would be doubt. But it's not. Doubt isn't even mentioned. Actually, sight is what the biggest blockade to faith is. So what we see is actually the very thing, what we see and observe and um, make conclusions based off of, because what we see is what we do that with, right? We, we take a look out into the world and we say, this is what I've observed and this is what I've concluded. That's sight. That is the opposite of faith. Weird. That's weird. It's like a whole, you know, it's a whole upside down world thing where you're like, wait a minute, how, what? How am I supposed to assess? How am I supposed to judge? How am I supposed to know? I do everything by sight. Everything from the time I'm a small child is by sight. Everything we do is by sight. Right? Okay, so we've got to learn a new system, a new operating system, so that we can live in the success that God wants us to live in. We have to learn to live by faith. And the thing about faith is that it supersedes sight. And it's not that sight is always bad or wrong. It's that sight, this sight that we see with our eyes, this is a limited viewpoint of eternity. We cannot see all the facets and components of eternity through these eyes. We are viewing life through a limited it's like looking through like a little hole in the fence and you can only see so much, you know what I mean? It's like, you think you know what's happening. But if you could remove the fence, well, you would see a whole lot more of what's going on behind that fence, right? That's what human and earthly sight is. It's a portion of what's true, but it's not the full picture. Okay, so faith supersedes sight because faith sees the big picture. Because faith is when you take what you think you know and you submit it to God and say, not what I think, not what I see, not what I know, but what you say is true. And it's a, it's a big move. It's a major move. It's a, it's a lifelong discovery of knowing how to live and walk in it at every moment. And that's why I say it's a lifestyle. I mean, faith, I, I've, I've thought through faith since the time I was a child. I was like, what is it? What is faith? I want to know. I want to know what faith is. It's the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things unseen. What? What does that mean? What does it mean? It's the substance and the evidence. What does that mean? Because is it just hope? Is it just belief? No. Those things are a part of it, but it's so much more. Faith is a, is a complete persuasion, but it goes beyond persuasion. It's a, it begins as a persuasion, but it goes on um, to be a foundation of behavior about everything you do in your life. Faith is foundational to every move you make. And you're going to come up against times where the word of God and what faith says is going to be, feel contradictory to what you feel like you know you should do. But when you are truly tapping into faith, you're going to do what he said no matter what. Even when it looks impossible. Even when it looks impossible. And you know, Okay, there's some big things that will look impossible. God's going to call you to do some things that you never thought you would do, that you never maybe wanted to do. It'll happen if you give yourself over to it. But even in the small ways, faith shapes our lives. You can't forgive people without faith. Not from big, terrible things that they do to you. Um, if you don't have faith, you will never stop gossiping about people. If you don't have faith, you will not know how to stop complaining if you're a complainer. If you don't have faith, you will forsake the gathering of the saints. 
Okay, so in every way, faith plays a part in everything we do because faith says, no, this is the will of God for my life and therefore I'm going to do it. No matter what it looks like, no matter what it costs me, no matter how hard it is, no matter how impossible it looks, I am anchored to the word of God and I am anchored to truth. Think about Esther. I've preached about Esther before. And Mordecai says to Esther when she is... um, She's married to the king, and and the Jews are about to be slaughtered. And he says, perhaps you were born for such a time as this. Okay? And this is a faith moment. Faith is opening up in this moment between these two individuals. And Esther is standing there. Because if she doesn't go in and plead on behalf of the Jews, they're all going to be dead. But she knows if she goes and enters this room where the king is, she might get her head chopped off. Because she's not allowed to go into his courts without being beckoned. So it's down to her life versus her people. Right, and, and he says, what if you've been born for such a time as this? <laughs> and that speaks to me so deeply because there's so many times that we have to stand up and do things that feel like we don't want to risk our reputation. We don't want to risk our dignity. We don't want to risk what it costs to be a part of the family of faith. We don't want to have to be the crazy worshipers like Katrina said. You might not understand it. And yet, what if we were born for such a time as this? And yet, what if this is the very salvation of our people? What if this is what's going to save many from the, from the um, destruction of separation from God for all eternity? What if we were born for such a time as this? And then we've got Caleb in, um, after Moses sends out the spies into the promised land to see if they can take it. Caleb comes back and he said, let us go take the land. We are well able to overcome it. We are well able to overcome it. He had a whole crowd of people sitting there saying, we can't do this. Um, There's no way. We're grasshoppers in their sight. They're giants. We can't take them. They're going to kill us. They're going to kill our children. They're going to kill our wives. And Caleb is standing there against, against all human wisdom saying, we are well able. Where did he get that boldness? Well, his boldness was born out of his feet being firmly planted on the foundation of faith that said, if God is for us, then who could be against us? And all this other group of people could not see that. Their whole entire existence was based on sight. All they could see was their limited vision, their limited peephole of what they could see into. And they were afraid because they didn't know how to wield faith. Let us be people that know how to wield faith. Let us be Caleb's who say, we are well able to take the land. Even when it doesn't make sense, we are well able. Because if our God is for us, then who could be against us? Who could be against us? Joseph, I love Joseph. In Genesis 45, he says to his brothers, he's sold into slavery by his family. It's like rough stuff. It's like woof, the worst of the worst. Your brothers take you. They sell you into slavery. Tell your dad that you're dead and don't look back. Brutal. It's brutal stuff. He goes through this whole trial, all the trials of his life. He's in prison time after time because of false accusations. And yet he remains faithful. And yet he remains faithful to the call of God in his life. And I'm sure that he had moments of doubt. And yet he continued to walk by faith and not by sight. And he finally comes this full circle moment and his brothers come back to him after all these years. And now he is like this mega powerful person and they're asking for a favor from him him, and he tells them who he is. And they start to weep and they start to cry. And he says, but now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. (laughs) Woo, let that be our testimony. That even when we look in the face of people who have sold us out, cut us off, and left us for dead, that we would say, don't even be angry with yourself because God sent me ahead to preserve life. He's sending you ahead. Sometimes you think it's a demotion and it's a promotion and you need to have eyes of the spirit to be able to see it. You have to walk by faith and not by sight. Come on, there's no other way to live a successful life. There's no other way to really win at life. Because, you know, at the end of life, we're all going to face the same end. And it's either going to be death, really true and pure death, separation from our creator, or it's going to be promotion into eternity, into something better. And we need to keep that front and center. Number two, we need to be people of principle and not of impulse. Okay, the whole world is walking around living by impulse. Whatever their feelings tell them, that's what they do. 
And it's creating chaos in families. It's creating chaos in society. It's creating chaos in children. It's creating chaos in the world. The instability of the world is because of impulsive living. It's a lack of principled living. It's a lack of um, taking, taking something and saying, that's how I'm going to conduct myself in life. All right, and on a very small scale, even in the midst of our own families and our own relationships and in our own church, we can produce small amounts of chaos by living under impulse and not under principle. God's principles work. They exist for a reason. They work to preserve love. They work to preserve community. They work to promote peace. They work to promote peace. Okay, so when we subscribe to and adhere to them, they produce those things inside of us and in those around us. If you want to have a stable family, you have to let go of impulse and you have to cling to principle. Okay, if your fruit of your family is instability, let's take a look in the mirror and say, where am I not living according to the principles of heaven? That is the problem. Now, I will say this. You can't live according to the principles of heaven without faith. You have to have faith in order that you would be able to be free from the law of sin and death, free from the curse of the thing that binds you, so that you are free to participate with heaven in the goodness that God wants you to participate with. Okay, so these things build on each other, but we must be people of principle. Do not throw out principle. There are certain things that are anchors in my life that guide me through every step. And I'm not saying they're easy, but I am saying that they are my foundation. They are my core value of beliefs. I do not willingly or knowingly or intentionally break outside of them and embrace it. And they're simple things, like I've already said. I don't gossip about people. Got to get rid of it. It's got to go. I forgive. I must forgive. I have to. I have to live in a place of forgiveness. I honor my leaders. That's it. The people that God has placed in my life who have invested in me, who have sown into me, I honor them despite their weaknesses, despite whatever I might think, I honor them because I know that God moves through the, the places and positions of authority that he has set up in this world. And I know that as I honor them, God is faithful to reach into their hearts and even shift and change their hearts and minds. I love my brother and my sister. I love them with an agape love. And I endeavor to do that more and more each day. I could go on and on and on, but we have to be people of principle. All right, I'm going to try to speed through this last one. But the third one is um, to, to live a life of success, to really win at life. We have to be a leader. We have to take on the mindset of a leader and not of a follower. We're all called to be leaders of some space in our life. And... Mark 9.35 says, sitting down, Jesus called the 12 and said, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and a servant of all. So what it means is that we must become servants of the body of Christ. We must become that. Um, you know, I teach my children very aggressively and very pointedly, and Jackson can affirm, <laughs> that you're not going to church so that you can hang out with your friends and be happy. I want him to hang out with his friends and be happy at church. I love it. It's good. It's all good. There's nothing wrong with it. But that is not the core reason why we attend church or why we are a part of the body of Christ. It is not about pleasing our own selfish ambition. And, as, and when that perk might not be there, we go anyway. Because we are servants of the Most High God. Because we are servants of the body. And my heart was just so blessed the other night because I don't know if you were here, but both Jamie and Jonas were running around there having so much fun in worship, but they were about to just, get, they were just going to launch off into orbit. So Jackson said, should I get them and take them into the prayer room? I said, yeah, that would probably be really helpful because all their parents were on stage. Sorry, guys. <laughs> so Jackson scooped them up and ran into the prayer room and I went in there a little bit and they, had, they kept bringing kids in and he was in there playing with them and, and entertaining them and he turned on the worship music 
music so they could sing along. And I was like, yes, come on. That is why you're here. That is your purpose. Your purpose isn't just to serve yourself, but your purpose is to serve others, to sow and to rich in good ground, to see what God can do and produce in your life, to become a leader of many. And he went, he dove into that space so easily and so willingly, and he, and he had a good heart about it. And I was like, that's my boy. Hey, <laughs> love you. <laughs> He's cringing, but, <laughs> but seriously, we got to take on that mindset. We have to take that mindset on. Get just okay. We all get pouty. We all get dowdy. We all have our days where we're like me, me, me. You know, like what about me? What about me? Okay. Mostly the girls get like that more than the guys, but but some of you guys. You know you do it too. All right, so we all have our moments and we're here to love each other. But the truth is, is that we gotta kick ourselves out of those moments. We gotta learn how to become overcomers. We have to learn how to say, no, I don't just exist to serve myself. I exist to be a part of the kingdom of faith. I exist to be a part of the body of Christ. I am a part of the bride of Christ. I am a child of the most high God. I will live by faith. I will wield my emotions and I will live a principled life. And I will serve others. And I will use my time and I will invest it wisely for God's kingdom so that I can receive a beautiful harvest of goodness in my life and my time of need. All right, and as we do that, guys, we're gonna win. We're gonna win. We're gonna be successful. That's where it lies. It's a lifestyle of faith that comes in and it alters everything we think, everything we say, and everything we do. And it continues day by day to reshape our thoughts, to look like the thoughts of heaven, to say, you know what? I got this. I can do this. It doesn't matter what hindrances are in my way. It doesn't matter what people say about me. It doesn't matter what obstacles come against me. But I know that I know that I know that I know that his word is true. And I am gonna live by everything that he says. My life bread is going to be the words that flow from his mouth. That's going to be the fuel, the source, the thing that drives me forward in my life. Why don't we all stand up right now and let's just pray. Lift your hands to heaven. Father, we dedicate this message to you, God, that it would sink deep into ourselves, into our, into our soul, into our DNA, that we would become the people of faith that you've called us to be, God, and that there would be an overcoming spirit that would wrap itself itself around us, that it would be near to us, God, that we would no longer bow and kowtow to these other ideas or these other thoughts. But Lord, I just thank you for these beautiful people, that you're empowering them, you're strengthening them with your goodness, God. You're causing your truth to unveil their eyes so that they can see themselves clearly, so that they can take up their, their mission in this world and that they can go execute it, that they could come together in a family of faith and show love and be loved, God. I pray right now for that that outpouring of your, um, the anointing of your understanding that Katrina talked about to come upon the minds of people, that they would be freed in worship. I declare a freedom in this place in worship, that people would be free to lift up their voices, lift up their hands, and begin to tap into the realms of praise, God. I thank you that we would be known as worshipers, that we would be known as people of faith, that we would be known as people of love, peace, and joy. And I bless these people in Jesus' name. Amen.